Okay, it leaves really you being okay if I, chat box. Yeah. Can I kick it off for us officially? All right. Awesome. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a nice uh, long holiday weekend if you're in the States. Uh, if not, I hope you're just doing okay. I know there's a bank holiday in the UK, so maybe hopefully some of you got the day off yesterday. But if you didn't, I'm glad you're here anyway because we're going to have some fun. We're going to be talking about legacy KPIs, how to report without losing your bonkers. We don't want that. We want you to stay calm and productive. And uh, legacy fundraising, one of my favorite topics right now. So thanks for being here. Nice to see a full room. Uh, hope you're doing okay. I'm Steven. I'm over here at Bloomerang. And uh, I'll be moderating today's uh, discussion, as always. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we get going here. Just want to let you all know that we are recording the session. And I'll be sending the recording as well as the slides later on today. If you didn't already get those, don't worry. We'll get you everything. Recording slides, handout. She's got like this really cool checklist for you she sent over. We'll get it all to you, so don't worry if you have to leave early or if you get disconnected or something weird happens. If a toddler comes in and inter interrupts you, don't worry. We'll get it to you. Um, but most importantly, please feel free to chat in any questions or comments you have this afternoon. Uh, we're going to leave some time for Q&A, so don't be shy. Send them in. There's a chat box. There's a Q&A box. You can use those. We'll find them. Don't worry. I'll even look at, um, at Twitter for, for those things, too, if you want to ask us a question there. Uh, if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, just want to say an extra special welcome to all you folks. If you've never heard of Bloomerang, we're a provider of donor management software. That's what Bloomerang is. It's what we're all about. But we do these webinars almost uh, a couple times a week now, nowadays, since uh, uh, the quarantine began, because we just want to get a lot of good information out there. But if you're interested in software, you can find us online, check out our website. There's all kinds of videos you can download, because um, uh, we'd love for you to learn more about that if you're interested. But don't do that right now. My favorite is coming back. Lisa Pena's back with us. She was here a couple weeks ago, right? You, were, you did an awesome legacy uh, fundraising <laughs> presentation for us and this is part two kind of it was kind of kind of kind of part one part two um but i'm excited to have you if you guys don't know alicia she's the global legacy manager over at greenpeace which is pretty much all you need to know about her chops for this topic um but she is all over the place she's written the uh, lots of articles she's written uh, a great book author of small shop fundraising the chapter in uh that's a textbook right alicia that's like a, a big not so much a text like not not a textbook. Oh, I have it here. Some oh, it's at the bottom of my bookshelf. But <laughs> don't pull it out. Um, I don't want to mess up your beautiful book arrangement. There. Yeah, everything is pretty much well balanced. <laughs> but yeah. But she's one of my favorite people. And um, legacy, like I said, is is this is something I've been getting asked a lot about over the past now almost three months. Should we be doing it? Should we stop doing it? How do we do it if we want? You know, we're, you're going to hear about all that. So, Luigi, I'm going <laughs> to pipe down because I've already taken up too much of your time. I'm going to stop sharing. Let you then, pull up your slides. I'm going to start sharing. Hopefully it works. <laughs> now here we go and share. Looks like it's working. All okay. Right. The floor is here, it working? Cool. Yeah. Looks great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here and it's, it's so weird to like be looking at just my slides and not being able to see faces, but um, know that um, I'm going to try to see how I can also um, see some of the comments and like stop every couple of slides. Um, honestly, uh, a lot of what I'll be presenting will have to switch out of PowerPoint and go into an Excel spreadsheet because the nuts and bolts of everything is in um, a PowerPoint, uh, is in the, the Excel spreadsheet. The, the, the. So as Stephen was saying, I'm the um, Global Legacy Manager at Greenpeace International, um, but I also am a legacy and fundraising coach at my own company, um, Globe Travel and Fundraiser, which is where you can find me. Um, and if you're going to be tweeting along this webinar, um, my Twitter handle is GlobetrottingFR. So tag me there, and, um, or you can even ask me questions there. And after the webinar, I'll be happy, happy, happy to answer them. Um, so what are we going to cover today? We're going to um, look at what's, what kind of, what are useful KPIs and what are vanity metrics, which is incredibly important to know the difference. Um, and basically this, this entire webinar is a case study. It's a case study of um, what we've done at Greenpeace International. Um, keep in mind that um, my role at Greenpeace um, for the past over four years 
has been um, to support and to build the capacity of all the legacy managers in, um, in the offices where we run programs, legacy programs. We have them in 14 different uh, countries around the globe, so, um, which is great and it's really cool because you get to learn and see how different countries do things. Um, so that's a really nice challenge. Um, it's a nice challenge, but also a very difficult challenge at times. And then we're going to talk about how to set reporting systems that provide you with what you need in order to make the business decisions. So that's what we'll be covering. Um, if you're in a position, and, and you know, going back to a little bit what Stephen and I were talking before everybody started jumping on the call, this may not be applicable to everybody. Now, what what I'm trying to explain is that I'm although I'm presenting the Greenpeace International case study of what we've done. Um, the tool that I'm, I'll be sharing with you, the dashboard, I've adapted it to what would be the reality of small, medium organization so that you don't have to sit there and go, okay, that's all fine and dandy for an international organization, but for my small shop, I don't know if this is doable. So I've made every effort to look at it through the lens of a small, medium size organization and a fundraiser that probably is alone doing this, okay? Um, it may not be completely perfect, but I've made an effort because as Stephen was saying, well, the first 15 years of my career were spent um, as a small shop fundraiser. So I know where you're coming from. All right, so what are vanity metrics? Um, so those are metrics that basically would look good to others, but don't necessarily help you to understand how your program is performing and how you can develop business decisions and develop future strategies. So um, I know that, you know, you talk to digital people and they'll say, well, you know, knowing how many likes you have is really great from this perspective that, you know, knowing how many likes on a Facebook post is a vanity metric because you can't build necessarily a strategy around that. So that's, that's like a, in simple, simple terms, what, um, what that means, um, what I mean by a vanity metric. Um, I'm trying to find, I had a little bit of a note here and I just lost it. Um, so what do we mean by this is, is you know, the, in order to figure out how it, in order to identify and put your metrics, the KPIs that you're evaluating, through the is it a vanity metrics kind of test, you need to ask yourself if the metric that you're reporting on is it enabling you to make the business decision that can be made with that the insights that you get from that metric. Okay, so it's really um, so that's one of the ways that you can start figuring that out um, because we know that like a vanity metric may look nice on the surface, but they hold very little substance. And so um, it's basically a very hollow metric if you can't make business decisions out of it. Um, you also want to ask, what can we do to intentionally reproduce the result, right? So um, this could be a perfect example of this would be um, the ice bucket challenge, which went viral, right? Now, is that something that can inten be intentionally reproduced? Many organizations have tried to do that and they weren't able to. And why? Because the metric in which they were evaluating that and the way it, it, this all happened, it was a one-off. It wasn't something that is normal and would be repeated on a regular basis. So that could be something um, that can help you vanity metric proof your, your KPIs. And the third, third is, is the data a real reflection of the truth? So, um, so sorry, I was just looking at the Q&A, so I'm glad that there's the ALS Society of Canada here. Um, and, and so they're confirming that, <laughs> I hope, I'm not sure if everybody can see the Q&A box and they, they're saying they can confirm that lightning doesn't strike twice. So there we go. So, you know, developing, fundraising strategies based on something like that, that basically is um, a one-off. It isn't something that can be repeated so, so, so easily, um, would basically set up your program. Um, I don't want to say for failure because it seems so 
drastic as a comment, but it could really set you up for disappointment because it's very difficult to replicate those kinds of one-off situations. Um, and as, as related to that, it's also if the data can be, uh, is, is a real reflection of what is actually happening on the ground at the moment when you're, when you're doing that kind of work. So here's what, what's happening. And, and the reason why I started with talking about vanity metrics is because when I started at Greenpeace in 2016, I felt that the way the reporting was being done was based on vanity metrics. So I came into a framework that was already in place by my predecessor, who um, was an absolute brilliant fundraiser. And you know, as with any organization, things sometimes you have to implement things that are perhaps not 100% good, but they're good enough for now because it's already a big step forward, right? Change takes a long time. And sometimes in order to get to that place where it's almost perfect, you need to go in stages. So you need to make decisions that, okay, well, right now it's not perfect, but it's, it's one step forward that, it's better than what we had before, right? So I don't want this to be interpreted as me throwing shade at my predecessor because she did a phenomenal, phenomenal job at um, putting in place this entire framework in which we, we've been working on for years. And so the reporting at, at, at Greenpeace is done on a quarterly basis. So every quarter, every single office has to submit all of their number, all their fundraising ratios, all their engagement, um, their fundraising numbers, all of their engagement numbers, everything. And so this is what the, the offices were reporting. The income, the full-time equivalent, so um, how many FTAs they had working dedicated to legacy marketing. The leads by stage development, and I'm gonna explain what that means um, in just one little minute. Um, the number of realized gifts from existing known and unknown supporters. Again, I'm going to explain that when I show you the dashboard, so bear with me. Um, the number of supporters over 55 years old and the number of face-to-face -face contacts. That was it. So, um, my question to you, and I guess we could use the Q&A box. If you were whether you already have a reporting system right now for your legacy program or you don't have one. If you were to receive this kind of information, which, um, which KPIs would you, do you think that you'd be able, you'd have enough information with that KPI that it would enable you to make a business decision moving forward on your program? So use the Q&A box and just put which, which one or several of those, the, the ones listed here, income, FTE, leads by stage development, that you would, um, you would know that that would be good information for you to make a business decision on it. Let's see. Yeah, so face-to-face -face contact, lead by stage. Uh-huh, supporters over 55, leads, income, right? Yep. Okay, income, number of supporters over 55, leads by stage. Cool, yeah. Awesome, all right, thank you everyone. Tried to make this as interactive as possible without having you in front of me, so that's really cool. Thank you so much. All right, so here was, there was a problem. And the thing is, is that, the biggest problem we have in legacies is that when all you do is look at um, the income, it only gives you a snapshot of what's happening today. It doesn't actually speak about what was done in order to get there and what will come in the future, right? So the biggest, biggest challenge we have is like, you see fundraisers and that fundraisers who ha who probably have a legacy program in organization oh great excuse the noise this is when the street sweepers decide to come by right when my webinar begins i'm sorry and of course it's really hot in here so i can't close my window hang on there you go apologies about that um sorry about that so the biggest challenge that we have in legacies is that people, organizations tend to try to report legacies the same way they would report 
on their major gift program, on their direct mail, on their channel marketing. Okay, I'm going to uh, change the slide because I was getting tired of having Tom Hanks look at us. Um, and it's really difficult to apply the same reporting um, approach for something that is immediately immediate transaction versus what is legacies, which is something that happens usually the, the gift is realized years after the ask is actually done, years after the solicitation, the marketing has happened. And so to simply look at income is not a true representation of the effort and the work that's been put by the fundraising team. So what needed to happen is we needed to look at um, the way we report, but we realized that by looking at the way we report, we also needed to look at the KPI definitions. What we found out was that every single office had a different way of reporting every single KPI. So basically, imagine this is 14 different countries in approximately different, the 19 different markets, because some offices have their multi country offices, like for instance, our Nordic uh, office has four countries, the four Nordic countries, for instance. Um, East Asia has several countries. Southeast Asia has four countries. So it's 14 offices, but approximately 20 markets, fundraising markets. So imagine 14, <laughs> it's 14 offices reporting 14 different ways. What do you think is the quality of the data we were getting? Kind of shoddy. Um, there was also very little buy-in um, to wanting to change the way that everybody reported because the way they were seeing is, oh, yet again, another change, which is going to be so much more work. So that was another issue. So we needed to, I needed to build social capital. Um, this was something that happened a year after I started working there when I went and I visited all the offices and realized that everybody was doing something completely different. And so we didn't have a clear picture of the situation, the legacy situation in the organization. And that was very problematic. And we also needed to connect the KPIs with the pipeline. So when I mentioned before in the previous slide about the leads by stage development, those are the different stages within our, um, our legacy pipeline. So, um, at the time when I started, there was a 10 stage pipeline model. We have since reduced it to six. Um, and so that's, that's a whole different webinar altogether. Um, so I needed to let the team members present the outcomes of the task force work. So this was a, a task force where um, I recruited some of the biggest, um, not the allies actually, um, half of the people in the task force were people who were against the idea of changing the KPIs and the reporting, and I brought them in especially for that. So what happened? Let me just switch from this, and I'm gonna switch to the actual dashboard so you can see, and I'm gonna go through the dashboard. And, oops, cancel here and share, and I almost accidentally pressed uh, end the call. So my mistake here. Hang on. Let me make this bigger. And bigger here. Okay. Is this, can, can, can this yeah, be this seen? Looks, this um, looks good, Leisha. Yeah, you made it nice and big. Can, yeah, it looks good. Okay. Fabulous. The sweeper's going me around again. The sweeper noise actually isn't too bad. I'm so days. sorry about that. The reality of working from home. Really? It sounds incredibly loud here. Um, <laughs> okay, fantastic. So I'll stop stressing about it. Um, it's just that it's too hot for me to close the balcony door and the, the door to my study. So this is what it looks like. Um, and so these are fake numbers. I just played around. It's, um, and this dashboard is in the head doubts that you'll be getting at the end of the webinar. So um, don't think that you need to start taking like screenshots or pictures um, because you will have it all, um, all, both pages in the dashboard. So, and again, you know, some of this data might be too much data for your organization. So it's up to you to determine what is best. But I'm, as I'm going to explain the dashboard, 
I'll make some recommendations of what things you could drop if it's too much. Um, I've already took out a few other uh, KPIs in there that were just excessive, like, you know, what is the potential of people over the age of 55 in your entire market? So if you're working in a state or in a province, you would look at your provinces or your state's um, statistics and see how many people over the age of 55 are living in that, your, that market. You don't need to go that you know, that far out. But here it, we're looking at total active supporters. So how many active supporters are in your database um, over the age of 55? So, and by active, we decided to define active as someone who has given a financial donation to your organization in the last two years. Um, and so, for illustration purposes, you know, I put a bunch of numbers and then total legacy pool. So this is an aggregate of these two lines. So what you would put in here is looking at how many people over the age of 55 are currently in your pipeline. So if your pipeline has different stages and here in this case, you can see leads by stage development that I was mentioning before we're talking about inquirers, we're talking about considerers, and intenders. And then of course, the last stage would be a pledger. Okay, so that's the four stages that you need. There's obviously the two other stages that I mentioned that we currently have are rejectors and, um, and like the realized gift. So, um, so if you want, so to, to be very clear, an inquirer would be anyone that you have solicited or who has proactively reached out to you inquiring about obtaining more information to leave a gift in their will, okay? So they're just getting information, that's it. Um, a considerer is, as the name basically is pretty straightforward, is someone that is considering their information, their, their decision. So they could have, um, received uh, an appeal from you and they've received your information and now they're considering their decision They're you know they're they're mulling it over and people can stay at this stage for a long time and sometimes they might stay in that at that stage forever intenders are much more specific so as you can imagine like if you were to take a funnel and put it sideways it's it's basically like inquire is large and as you go closer closer towards pledger your funnel gets smaller right so an intender is someone who is intending to do it to, to leave a gift in their will so they said yes i will do it you know and they're either in the stage of i need to discuss my intentions with my family or they are they need to book an appointment with their legal advisor or financial planner or whatever the case may be so that's what those three definitions are. The pledger is obviously the person who has already pledged their gift to you. So they let you know that they, um, um, they, you, are, you are in, in the will, okay? Um, so let me just stop very quickly to see the questions. What are the fiscal quarters? Um, well, in this case, is whatever it's Q1, you know, whatever your quarters are. So for Greenpeace, our fiscal years, well, for most offices is January 1st. Um, in Australia, I think it's standard that everything um, is July 1st. So their quarters are a little bit different. Um, but for global reporting, it's January to December. So Q1 would be um, end of March. Um, Heather asks, do you know the, of this of software that can help us to obtain birth dates of constituents? Um, as far as I know, unfortunately, there is no such software. Um, this is, um, and it's actually probably the number one question I get when I do these uh, webinars or do trainings. And um, I would say you can do it through a survey um, and ask uh, your supporters for their year of birth. And, um, you know, as a demographic information and, you know, you would have to reassure them that this is not, you know, being shared anywhere else. So that's a great way to, to get your birth. Um, 
do, do we do we ask supporters to provide birth dates? We try to, um, of course, since uh, for because a lot of our legacy programs are in Europe, and since GDPR has been put in place, um, it's become more difficult. But you can, you know, if you do like a survey to do some prospecting to see who in your database can uh, is interested in, in, in legacy giving, then you can ask as one of the questions, you know, what is your year of birth for demographic purposes? And so that gives you a little bit of an idea of where you would, you know, how you would develop your strategy. Um, oh, Brittany says that donor search can do something like this. So great. Thank you for sharing that, Brittany, um, for um, identifying the age of donors. I was not aware of that. So that's really cool. Um, okay, let me continue um, and then I'll come back to the next questions. Um, all right, so where were we? We were at existing supporters in the legacy pipeline. Um, so, right, so these are the people over the age of 55 um, that they've already been um, solicited or approached and they are currently in your pipeline. And then existing supporters not in the legacy pipeline is basically anybody that's over the age of 55 that's in your database, but has not been solicited. And it's basically those who could potentially be approached for a legacy gift or to be put in through, you know, whatever strategy you decide to uh, bring them in, okay? So then the next section of the dashboard, um, so I want, like, Imagine that this is going from very macro and then going micro as we go down in the pipeline, in, in the dashboard. So then we look at the supporters contacted. So you saw in the presentation, I was saying like, they, they were reporting how many face-to-face -face visits they were having. Here's a reality of an organization like Greenpeace where um, oftentimes you will only have one legacy fundraiser um, in an office in a country, in the country, um, you know, and, and um, having to manage a portfolio of thousands of supporters. Basically, the approach is really much focused on mass marketing. And then the more, the more personalized stuff happens at stage four where you're talking about intenders. It is not realistic for organizations like that to be doing a lot of mass marketing. Having said that, let's say in the context of a small, medium-sized organization, I feel very strongly that even if you don't have a huge mass marketing approach in your legacy program, you should be reporting on this. My rationale in here, and I had to, I had to really, I don't want to say argue, but I had to really make my case, is that only talking about um, the face-to-face -face approach was not a fair representation of the effort and the time required to do all the work of uh, a legacy manager. What I mean by that is, you know, we have to be straddling two worlds of doing mass marketing and developing great impactful appeals and surveys and newsletters and this and that and all kinds of stuff, while at the same time offering that highly personalized um, service to, to donors. And so by only reporting on one area of the work that we were doing, it was not painting the complete picture of the effort and the challenge and the, the difficulty and the complexity that it is to be a legacy manager. And so obviously we were very, very realistic in the fact that it would not, like the mass marketing approach would not be an exact, exact number. But basically I was saying, uh, you know, I told them just look at, if you do in one quarter, one appeal in one survey, let's say, just look at, okay, who, you know, your segmentation, how many people were in there, and that's good enough. At least it gives us an idea of how much work you've done in that area. And the personalized approach, the way we defined it is anything that would be like a one-on-one -on -one email, a one-on-one -on -one conversation on the phone, or, you know, a house visit, et cetera, things like that. Okay. So that's what, um, the this section is about the main main objective what i really wanted um the legacy managers to understand is that i want them to get the recognition they re they need of um the section that says pool of prospects is all about showing 
what's in the pipeline and what potential you have, but also demonstrating the amount of effort you're putting in to um, do all this, right? Um, so, so yeah, uh, someone uh, anonymous uh, is asking, how did it get, you know, what could personalize, what could have happened that you go from 75 personalized approach to 450? Um, let's just say they had um, a legacy event, a specific legacy event. Let's say they would have done that. I was just throwing numbers here and there. It's just for illustration purposes, but let's not get crazy here. Um, don't take it too, too, too seriously, just saying. Okay, so inquirers. So as you can see, you know, as I was saying that normally you would have a higher number of inquirers and as you move people through the pipeline, there are less and less people, right? Um, so inquirers, as I said, anybody that would have requested additional information or would have inquired about your program, your legacy program, et cetera. So someone that fits that bill. What's really important to say is that the leads by stage development, um, they're not age specific. The only place where they are age specific is when we're looking at the pool, the total legacy pool. But leads by stage development, you know, if you have someone that is 45 that is writing their first will and they reach out to you and they inquired or, or said they're considering leaving gift um, in their will to your organization, then you would put them in there. So don't exclude anybody because of their age. Because yes, the gift might be realized in a long, long time, but you never know, life's the way it is. It could also be realized sooner than 20 years. So the, lead by the leads by stage development is not um, dependent on an, a specific age, okay? Um, so Sarah is asking, how often do you review the stages of pipeline for the prospects? So this is something that actually, it's something that we talk about um, in my, um, my webinar, uh, building a, a legacy pipeline. It's actually something you're constantly working because if you're a hundred percent, if you dedicate a hundred percent of your time in legacies, or if you're dedicated fifty percent of your time, it's basically what you would be doing. You'd be looking at your numbers and and developing strategies to move people through that pipeline. Now, to answer more specifically, you would update these numbers, you wouldn't be up updating them on a regular basis. You would update them when you're supposed to um, report. So if in your organization you report on a monthly basis, you might do that on a monthly basis. As I was saying at the beginning of the, um, a, a little earlier, um, for uh, globally, all of our offices report on a quarterly basis. So that's when they update these numbers. In between those three months, they don't update it. They just do it. They just basically run their numbers at the end. Um, and so, uh, so then, so that's inquire, consider, like I said, someone that either has received information or they've looked at things on your website and, um, or they took part in some sort of activity or you had a conversation with them and they said, Oh, you know, that's interesting. I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'll consider that as I make my decisions. Um, so that's what it, it defines. It, that's how it's defined. And then in tender is someone that is like, now they've decided that they will, they just need to basically sign on the dotted line and like confirm it. So, um, that's what that is. Um, let me just look and see. Anne is asking, have you run legacy event? What did that involve? So legacy events that have been run at Greenpeace, they take different forms depending on the office. Um, our Dutch office always has a legacy event specifically for legacy pledgers and intenders. And usually it's, it's, it's basically a, 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 like a lunch um, in their garden because they have a garden. Um, and they'll have like a, a lunch with um, all the legacy pledgers and they'll have, a um, they'll have um, an update from some of our program people on whatever campaign they're cur currently running. Like perhaps like one of the biggest campaign they're running, like in the past they had a bee campaign. So what's going on with our work that Greenpeace is doing around bees and protecting bees, et cetera. Um, and a, a, a legacy event that is really, really popular um, at our Greenpeace UK office is um, is a garden party that happens so right behind the building of where the office of Greenpeace UK is. They also have um, the warehouse, 
okay, the, the Greenpeace Warehouse. And what happens at the Greenpeace Warehouse, and Natasha, who I know is also on this call and is the person that started the entire legacy program at Greenpeace way back um, in her day, um, being able to go into the warehouse of one of the Greenpeace office is a huge honor and it's a privilege because that's where all of the campaign, all the actions that take place, like that's where they plan them, that's where they rehearse them, that's where they prepare them. It's usually a place that's only restricted to actions people. I have been to the Greenpeace UK office three times. I have never been allowed in that building um, because it's top secret stuff. And so once a year, they open up the warehouse and you can actually go in and like, you can test some of the stuff, you can touch the Zodiac, you can touch like, you know, it's like very, very exclusive. So that's the kind of events that happen. So you have to look at in your organization, if you can do, what kind of things you can do that would be similar of being very, very special. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on because it's, you know, get back to the dashboard. Um, all right. As you can tell, I really love talking about this. So I could go on and on and on for hours. Um, next, what are we looking at? Total pledges, including from prior years. So what are we looking at? So these are the pledges that um, have been confirmed. So you actually have been told by the donor that you, your organization is in the will. And then what we see here is all the new pledges in the current year. So um, the number above. So for instance, Q1 that says, to 123 that would be everything is cumulative okay and then whatever you the number in new pledges in cur current year is for that quarter so in that quarter so q1 they received two new pledges okay so now technically the organization would have 127 uh, sorry 125 i was looking on the right num wrong number 125 pledges expectancies okay clear now, the next part, the total realized gifts. So what that means is how many gifts have been realized, how many um, notifications you have received by the notary, the executor, that a person has passed away and has left a gift in their will to you. This is where things get a little bit dicey, um, and I'll explain why. Here we have it split between existing, known, and unknown support. So let me explain the distinction between the three. Now, you might choose not to report on this. This is getting very, very micro. And it might not be an insight that is useful to you. For a big global organization, for us, it's quite helpful. And I'll explain why. Existing supporter is the way we define it is someone who, um, was in our pipeline, so was in that country's um, pipeline, legacy pipeline, and they have passed away, okay? Um, so that's existing supporter. Known supporter, the distinction between that, and it's a very minute, is someone that was in the database but was not necessarily in a leg the, the legacy pipeline. So they were, they had probably signed a petition or taken part in an action, or had given um, in the past or were a current active donor, but never ever got, um, was part of the legacy pipeline. So either they were not asked or they never responded. So there's a distinction between the two. One is because they were in the pipeline, the other one is they were not in the pipeline. An unknown supporter is someone who is completely unknown, was not in the pipeline, was not in the database at all. Like, this person is a complete stranger to the organization. Now, the reason why that's important to us is because what we've been able to, to see globally is that between 55 and 65% of gifts, that, gifts and wills that come into the organization comes from people who are completely unknown to the organization. So you can basically extrapolate and you can make a, an assumption that let's say you've got 125 confirmed pledges, you can anticipate that there's a high probability that, to, that you would get an additional um, 75, um, no, a bit more than 75, sorry, about like 85, 90, uh, 85 um, more gifts that come in. So 50% more would come in and be realized in the future. 
So that helps you gauge a little bit how much potential your organization really truly has. If you know that, let's say 50% 50 of gifts are really not coming from people you, you know in your database. A really interesting insight is that when I shared this with, um, with participants to uh, a session I gave at the AFP Toronto Congress, someone raised their hand and said she was from a small community hospital in um, some town in the province of Ontario here in Canada. And she said for them, for that small hospital, it was 70% of legacy gifts came from people who were completely unknown. So this speaks volume about um, how much reach an organization can have in a community if they were to communicate broadly that they can leave, that donors can leave a gift in their will. So let me pause for a second to take a few questions here. Um, do you create constituency codes for inquirers, considerers, and intenders to efficiently pull? Yes, yes, Heather, good point. Absolutely. So everyone is coded in the database so that it's easier to know. So you do not want to be running a, a parallel like spreadsheet or database to your database. You want to have everything housed in the database. And actually, hey, Stephen, maybe this is an action item for us. It'd be great, really cool to see how in Bloomerang this is um, coded and how all of these things can be facilitated in Bloomerang. How's yeah, you can do it however you want. We don't, yeah. we don't lock you into a uh, certain terminology. We just let you say, Hey, or whatever you want to call your custom field. So you could literally call them your, your exact terminology, for example, mm -hmm. easy if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Cool. Um, so Ron asked, what's the difference between existing supporter and known supporter? So I just, I just explained that. How do you track which stage, stages someone's in, in your fundraising database or in some other way? So everything is tracked in the, in the database. So, uh, Greenpeace, um, before I started, they, they started transitioning to Salesforce and like a version of Salesforce that's really, really per, like, uh, tailored to the Greenpeace, um, model. So, um, they've been, since then, have been integrating it through phases from office to office. So it's all in Salesforce. And it's it really, like, at the end of the day, most databases will have, like, a very, like, they might have a different interface, but the back end is pretty much all the same. So they're all, they all have, like, constituent codes and they're tagged based on their stage. So pretty easy. So then all you have to do is just build your report and pull that data. And, of course, I'm sharing with you... Um, this the spreadsheet you could basically build this this dashboard um in whatever tool you have if you have that capacity in your database you can build something similar it doesn't have to look like this but you can build something similar of that um of this magnitude you can also do it using tableau which is a great tool if you're using google tools um we're also using uh, Google Dashboard as well um, to report on like other global numbers. So there's a lot of great tools out there that, I mean, I mean I'm just showing this because that's how the information comes to us from international, from our insights team. But, and also because, you know, it's coming, it's aggregated information coming from, you know, 14 different countries. So it's up to you to see, like take this and be like, okay, well, so how can we integrate that? So it's automated, make your life easier. Let me continue because it's God, the hour goes by really quickly. So, um, the average average pledge amount is basically um, how much um, realized income has come in based on how many gifts are are realized, right? So these are all um, um, formulas here. We also report something that we were not reporting, and it'd be often a question that I would get asked is. Um, you know, how much, how much another office is, is investing in legacy marketing in order to do that ratio between investment and results, right? So we started reporting on the total legacy cost. And so we separated the legacy marketing and operational costs from the legacy staff cost. So we put that in there. So that gives us a bit more insights. And then the realized income, the new pledge income of what we expect and then, you know, the profit could use a different term, obviously, but the profit margin, right? Um, and then this is basically the total pledge balance outstanding is using basically the, um, the average 
um, the average pledge amount multiplied by the total pledges that is expected. Of course, this is, you know, you have to take this with a little bit of grain of salt because, you know, that number, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a number that you're going to get next year or next quarter, but it gives you, what it does is it gives you a snapshot of the total value of the portfolio of your legacy program. And to me, that was really important because I wanted to shift the thinking and you, and, and this is why I, I feel so strongly about this, this tool and in whatever form it takes for you and your organization. Um, if we really want to change the mindset and the way uh, management and our colleagues, and I'm talking here about managing up, managing down, managing sideways. Um, if we want to change that mindset about what legacy fundraising is and about the potential that it presents to an organization, I find I, I believe wholeheartedly that this tool is perhaps one of the best tools or any form of this tool to be able to make that case. Because when you can say, look, um, don't stop, you know, how at the beginning I, I said, looking at how much money has come in in this quarter is not a good example of how good you're doing because that's work that was done 5 10 15 years ago so that's not a true representation of your effort but when you look at this number and this number you know that if you move these people um, in your pipeline to confirm their pledge and you look at the average pledge amount this is what the value of your portfolio looks like. And so now it brings a different perspective about your legacy program that is very powerful because then it means I need to invest in stewarding these 125 um, pledgers in addition to having to convert all of these folks into pledgers in order to tap into this money and more. Does that make sense? Like, like this is what the focus should be on. It should be on acquiring and converting all of the people in pipe in the pipeline in order to tap into that money. Otherwise you're never going to get there. Right? So how do you do this? So this is what, this is the bit that gets me super excited is um, the quarterly program efficiency KPIs. And basically these are all um, um, formulas. Really, like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't do any of these calculations because I've never been good at math and arithmetic. So um, I'm out when it comes to this. But luckily, there was a really smart <laughs> insight person that helped me out with this. And we were able to come up with great insights. And so this is where it tells you quarter to quarter how your, how your program is evolving um, by looking at the pool volume, by active supporters, the number of leads by the pool volume, et cetera. So you see here, like you see that you start off at Q1, your number of leads in comparison to the volume that you have in your pool is at 45%. Um, and then in Q3, it decreases. So if, if you're looking at it from a management perspective, um, if you put on your, 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 you know, your management hat, and you go, okay, is there something going on? That number went down, what's going on? Do we need to reassess our, our strategy? Do we need to do something different at next quarter in order to boost that? Um, again, total numbers of supporters contacted versus the pool volume. The number goes up and then the number goes down. You remember how someone asked me, well, what could have happened that, you know, suddenly there was 400, you know, there were 45, 75 people approach and then suddenly, oh, 450. Maybe there was an event. That explains this number, right? And so you can see those numbers shifting and so on. Um, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and so this is what it is. This is, uh, these are numbers I created for 2018, let's say. And then for comparison, purposes um 2019 so it's basically the same table i i fudged around with some of the numbers and stuff like that the only difference is that the year two then you have um the annual growth rate so in comparison to the previous year so it gives you more insights you can compare year one to year two so if you're starting out you know, your year one is your benchmark and then year, year sorry, yeah. Year zero technically would be your, your starting point and then year one is your first benchmark and then you move on and on and on for and, and move on accordingly. Um, so that's, that's, your, that's the dashboard. So let me flip back to 
um, how do I submit that? Stop sharing. I want to share a different page now. I want to go back to my PowerPoint here. Let me go desktop. No. Sorry, give me one second. Let me just um, go back to sharing. And I do want to answer your questions. So I just want to finish the PowerPoint and then I want to answer all your questions because I see that the time is, is running. So we already did this. So basically, looking at, um, at the, the, the dashboard and so on, as I mentioned, you really want to focus on the lead acquisition and the conversion and focus more on that and focus less on income received. I know what's going to happen. Senior management will, and, and board members will stop at looking at, the, they'll see the income and they'll be like, that's it. I don't want to hear anything else. That's all that matters to me. But you need to, um, I, that's why I've, um, this dashboard can paint a completely different picture of your legacy program so that you can start having those conversations about the importance of stewardship, the importance of acquisition, of investing in, in um, acquisition and conversion of your, your leads, your, your bequest leads, so that you can then get that income, okay? You want to take your time because this is going to take, it's a big mindset shift. It's, you're basically asking senior management and everybody to look at the results for that particular fundraising program through a completely different lens than what would be done with, you know, your DM, your annual campaign and your major gifts program. And so that's, it's going to take time, but that's why this tool is so powerful if you present it in this way. And then of course, monitor and adjust accordingly. Like, like, you know, it's, th this tool is great. It's not perfect. It's not answering all the questions that we have at Greenpeace, but it's a huge step forward from where we came from before. And we know, and like I've updated and I've tweaked it in the last two years since we've been using it. And so it's, it's a dynamic tool that needs to, you need to keep working at and improving as your program grows and develops and becomes more mature. Um, so that's, that's the dashboard and I hope you haven't lost your mind because I thought I was losing my mind when I first started working on it. So, um, all right. So this is me. If you have additional questions, I'm going to take time now to, to answer your questions. Um, but you can always, always write to me. I, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this and I love this. I love my work. So I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so let me take, let me go through the Q and A um, or Steven, I don't know if you've got some that are coming from Twitter or something like that, but here. Um, and if I miss some of your questions, I do apologize, do, but do reach out to me. I'm trying to see all of, um, okay. So what paperwork do you require from the donor to book the pledge? Ah, good question, Christina. Um, most of the time it's done virtually, verb, excuse me, verb, verbally. Um, different donors will, can, will share that information differently. I encourage my fundraising, um, my legacy managers to ask donors to complete a gift announcement form, which is basically a form that enables a donor to let us know, um, you know, the terms of the gift, et cetera. Um, also notify us of who the executor is, how they want to be recognized, what kind of recognition they want to have. It also gives them the power to decide to be to remain anonymous. Um, and but the most important bit about that document is that it um, enables them to. We ask them to provide a message for the future generation. And so it's it's a very highly personalized tool. Some offices are using it. Not all of all of uh, not all of them are using it. But if that's something you would like to try with your donors, because it's something you can send out in the mail or you could do over the phone or you can do it, um, you can do it as a, as a landing page in your, on your legacy web, website, on your legacy webpage. Um, I do have a sample on my website on Globetrotting Fundraiser. If you click on the resources page, you will find the gift announcement form right there and you can have a sample there. And there's a bunch of other resources that you can download. Um, John is asking, a legacy donor is defined by one that makes any donor level of a planned gift. Yeah, well, so you know what, you raise a good point, um, John, because I didn't, I didn't define exactly what I meant by legacy um, at the top of the, of the webinar. In this, for the, 
for this webinar, what I'm referring to in legacies is really gifts and wills. So a bequest. Um, at Greenpeace, we really only do bequests. And in some countries, like in Spain and Switzerland, we also do life insurance. But we don't do all of the financial products like we do in Canada or in the US. Um, because that's the minority of the gifts that come in. And really, when you look at, um, you know, when you look at the ensemble of all the planned gifts that come in um, to nonprofits, the, you know, the vast majority, I would say maybe adventure guess that it's probably about 85%. 85% of planned gifts come from bequests. So if you're in a small organization, should you be wasting your time on, you know, trying to get gifts that only represent 15% of what you would probably get? Probably not. So it's the, 80, it's, it's the Pareto principle, right? So um, that's what you want to be doing. Uh, if here, if you don't have a similar capacity in your database, what do you recommend? I think you're referring to the, to the, to this, to them, the dashboard, well, use it, do, do Excel. You can do something like that. Like, I mean, we do it in Excel, like the, all the numbers are, are aggregated in Excel spreadsheets given to insights and then they just transfer the data. They copy the, the information. So, um, so yeah, you can do that. Um, oh, Jeanette, you're on the call. Great. Awesome. Um, how do you estimate the average pledge amount given that many bequests are not specific amounts, but a percentage of residual estate? Well, so that's basically, it's, it's an average, it's a formula in the, in the dashboard um, that looks at what has come in. So, um, so basically whatever has come in so far, they do an average based on how many, how many bequests that represented. So um, it, what, so one thing, one, one comment that, we have observed and we're not quite there to um, add that in the dashboard is doing the differentiation between a pecuniary gift and a residual gift. Um, some offices wanted to have the difference so that we know how much comes from pecuniary and how much comes from residual. Um, but um, the majority of people decide not to include that. So we decided not to, but to answer your question, it's, it's basically all the money that's come in that's how the average gift is calculated. Um, let's see, will you be emailing your sample dashboard with the formulas? You'll get, actually you get a PDF of it. I'm not allowed to share the actual Excel spreadsheet, I'm afraid, but you know, if you're a little bit good, like honestly, when you look at that, you know, they're quite well defined. So you can pretty much figure out, oh, okay, it's that field and that field. So you just do like the division really. Um, but because it's something that was developed by a consultant to, for Greenpeace, I'm not allowed to share the actual source file. Um, but you do get the whole uh, PDF of both sheets, so you see how it's done. Let me see. Um, Stephen, are, are we good to stay, if, to stay a few minutes? Yeah, more why don't, people why don't we stay, do five or? more minutes since, uh, since there was since, that outage? Yeah, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> Um, do, do, do. What can exception language can be found for plan gift who are concerned that their area of interest will not exist when they pass? It can be a hurdle for signing up. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, like, um, oh, I understand. So I think, Michelle, I think what you're referring to is if they decide to, de if the donor decides to des designate a gift to a specific program and then that program doesn't exist, I'm assuming that that's what you're, you're referring to. There is um, a power to vary clause. Um, there is sample language in my, on my website that you can get. And in there, there's a paragraph. And then of course, again, you need to make sure that any sample language gets verified by your a legal advisor in your, where you are. Um, but it's basically, um, a wording, it's a short paragraph that basically says that, you know, the donor, um, recognizes that should that program know, like if you do offer the option to designate a bequest that, the donor recognizes that should that program no longer be in existence at the time when the gifts comes in, that the let the board decide, make that decision on their behalf. And so that that's what a power to vary clause would be. And so you want to provide that to your donors just in case. But if you don't offer your donors the option to designate their request to a specific program, then you don't need that. That's not necessary. Um, some fundraisers talk about pipeline generically and then others have a written plan. Do you have a template you could share? Um, 
Um, yeah, there's a template I usually share when I do uh, my pipeline. Um, well, basically, you kind of already have it in that dashboard because that's those are the stages basically. And so then you have to decide how you specifically define them in your organization. So you don't, you know, I don't want to presume that, you know, the way we define them at Greenpeace is, is applicable or relevant to your organization. But if you use intenders, considerers, uh, sorry, inquirers, intenders, considerers, and planters, you've got yourself a pipeline. So you can use those, that terminology and then you build your, your program accordingly. Um, okay, um, I'm trying to cover everything. Would you recommend some small shops divide between residual and non-residual? Um, if I, you know what, you can, if, you're, if, if you've got the capacity to report that, you know, um, in a lot of the small shops I worked at where I was the only fundraiser doing absolutely everything from like, direct mail to grant writing to major gift and developing a legacy program there was no way it was just too difficult but sometimes it's easier because you don't have a lot of volume so it's really easy to do it so if you have that capacity definitely definitely separate do the separation in your reporting between pecuniary and residual absolutely um John asks, are you able to look at websites and make recommendations as to how KPIs are sourced? I don't have the capacity. I don't have that kind of infrastructure to do that. Um, but maybe we could talk and you can tell me a little bit more what you're looking for. Um, so if you want to pop me an email, John, um, I'd be happy to, to look at that. And if I don't know, like maybe there's someone I know that could help with that. Um, do, 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 all wheels should have a power to vary regardless if the organization offers designated or not. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Let's see. Anything else? Am I missing? Sorry, database question was referring to coding of where people are in the pipeline. If we don't have the ability to code where people are, do you have suggestions for how to not have to mutually, uh, manually track? Mm. That's kind of strange that your database wouldn't have that ability to code. And I'm sure perhaps, I mean, I, what I've done in the past is I've fudged some of like the fields and made like a business decision where like it was a field that wasn't being used. I just fudged it and said, okay, well, this is going to be the, the field I use to um, identify them as, as um, you know, prospects or whatever. Um, I, I didn't have like, for instance, in my last organization, it was a small, small organization here in Montreal. And because we didn't have, I was in the process of establishing the legacy program. We couldn't afford to buy, like we implemented Razor's Edge. Sorry, um, Stephen. Um, <laughs> and so we implemented Razor's Edge and I didn't have the capacity. We didn't have the funds um, or the volume of prospects in order to pay for the module for, for uh, bequests, for plan giving. And so I just used one of the other fields and just designated it as that. And so that's how I got around it. You know, there's always a way to find ways. Um, so yeah, I'm, I know I'm, I'm probably missing a few questions because I'm trying to scroll up and down, but if I didn't get to your question, I do apologize, but do, do, do write to me, Ligia at globetrottingfundraiser.com and I'll, be, I'll do my best to answer you. That was awesome. I really like seeing your, your, your spreadsheet. I feel like I got a, a peek behind the curtain on some of this stuff. This is really <laughs> cool, Alicia. Thanks for doing this. And this is, I said this at the top, but I wanted to thank you again for doing two sessions for us um, in such a short amount of time. It was your idea. You reached out very gracious. You know, you want to do this for the community. So I, I really appreciate and it's good to see you twice in a row so yeah. quickly when we're normally it's, it's months apart at conferences, yeah. I feel like. So this is awesome. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, I love doing this. So anytime, I'm always happy to do more for Bloomerang. And obviously reach out to her. Uh, you got that very kind offer from her. So take advantage of it. She's obviously a wealth of knowledge and uh, one of my favorites for, for that that's worth. So this has been fun. This is a nice way to start off uh, my week. We weren't working yesterday here in the States. So this is a good way to kick things off. So thanks to all of you for hanging out with us um, during your, your busy day, I'm sure. So I'm going to, Alicia, I'm going to take this screen away. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. We've got a webinar. Uh, we got a peer-to-peer -peer webinar coming up Ooh. next week. 
So check out the Bloomerang resources page. We got lots of cool sessions coming up. We're scheduling them out into the fall now already. Um, so hopefully we'll see you again on another session. So look for an email from me. The slides recording will send out Leisure's spreadsheet also, the one she was showing today live. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again uh, on another Bloomerang webinar. So stay cool out there. I know it's hot where you are, Leisure. It's hot here in Indy too. So hopefully you guys are all staying cool, healthy, productive. We're thinking about you all. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in another webinar. So we'll call it a day there. See y'all. Bye. Bye.